When many people think of Jamaica, they imagine sun, sea, sand, Usain Bolt, Bob Marley, marijuana, and Rastas. For Jamaica's leaders, Rastafari has been an important aspect of the country's global brand. Struggling with high unemployment, vast inequality, extreme poverty, and crippling debt burdens from international monetary fund agreements, they have relied on Brand Jamaica, the government's deliberate marketing push that began in the 60s to attract tourist dollars and foreign investment to the island. With the rise of Bob Marley in the early 70s, it's unsurprising that Brand Jamaica has packaged the Rastafarian movement as a good thing. Rasta and Ganga are now so synonymous with Jamaica that it may surprise you to know that Rastafarians were not well-loved in Jamaica and were persecuted as a strange cult. The movement is referred to as the Rastafari movement, Rasta or Rastafari. The Rastafari movement is named for Rastafari Makoen, who was crowned Emperor Haile Selassie I of Ethiopia on November 2, 1930. It is a religious political movement that believes in the divinity and or messiahship of Haile Selassie. The movement began before Haile Selassie was crowned. It fully took shape in the slums of Jamaica in the 1920s. Some Rastafarians see Rasta more as a way of life than a religion. The practices usually include vegetarianism, wearing one's hair in dreadlocks, avoiding alcohol, and the ritual use of marijuana. There is no formal organization and many varying beliefs within the movement. What unites them is the resistance to oppression, a belief in sustainable living, and pride in their African heritage. Rastas believe in a black god, the god of Ethiopia embodied in Haile Selassie. The numerous references to Ethiopia and Egypt in the Bible confirm their belief that God is black. Such a belief challenges Christianity, which advocates a white image of God through the numerous paintings, drawings, and statues depicting Jesus Christ with white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Rastas dislike the term Rastafarianism because they reject the isms and schisms that characterize an oppressive and corrupt white society. They see a wide range of isms and schisms in modern society, for example, communism and capitalism, and want no part in them. For instance, Haile Selassie was anti-communist during the Cold War and was deposed by a Marxist coup. Today there are three main sects or orders of Rastafari, the Twelve Tribes of Israel, the Nyabingi Order, and Bobo Ashanti. They all agree on the basic principles of the divine status of Haile Selassie and the importance of black images of divinity. Many Rastafari do not belong to any sect. The Nyabingi Order, also known as Haile Selassie I Theocratical Order of the Nyabingi Reign, is the oldest of the Rastafari orders. It is named after Queen Nyabingi, the ruler of Uganda during the 19th century, who fought against colonialism. The Nyabingi Order adheres to ancient biblical values and focuses primarily on Haile Selassie I and their eventual return to Africa. It is overseen by an assembly of elders. Prince Emmanuel Charles Edwards founded Bobo Ashanti in Jamaica in 1958. Bobo means black, and Ashanti refers to the Ashanti ethnic group in Ghana from which the most Jamaican slaves originated. Members of Bobo Ashanti are also known as Bobo Dreads. In belief, Bobo Dreads are distinguished by their worship of Prince Emmanuel, in addition to Marcus Garvey and Haile Selassie, as a reincarnation of Christ and embodiment of Jah, their emphasis on the return to Africa and their demands for monetary reimbursement for slavery. Members of the Bobo Ashanti order wear long robes and tightly wrapped turbans around their dreads. They adhere closely to the Jewish law, including the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday and hygiene laws for menstruating women. They live separately from Jamaican society and other Rastafarians, growing their produce and selling straw hats and brooms. They often carry brooms with them to symbolize their cleanliness. The Twelve Tribes of Israel sect was founded by Dr. Vernon Prophet Gad Carrington in 1968. It is the most liberal of the Rastafarian orders, and its members are free to worship at the church of their choice. Members of this sect belong to one of the twelve tribes, or houses, which are determined by the month of their birth and represent a color, a part of the body, and a character trait termed a faculty. These Rastafarians consider themselves more of an ethnicity rather than a religion. They don't have to be dreadlocked or turban. They can be bald or short-haired.
Before moving forward, we need to take a step back to what was happening in Jamaica after slavery ended, as the trials and tribulations helped shape the Rasta foreigners. After the abolition of slavery, most available work was on the very same plantations that formerly enslaved people had worked on, and some plantation owners continued to mistreat workers as if slavery never ended. In 1865, the black population of Jamaica had almost nothing to show for their nearly 30 years of emancipation from slavery. The majority of people had inadequate rights to land. Rent and taxes were high, as was unemployment and wages were dismally low. Drought and flood had severely affected the small provision grounds that some managed to cultivate. Imported goods were unaffordable as prices were drastically inflated due to the American Civil War. Since they could not create a sharecropping tenant class like the one established in the post-Civil War South of the United States, planters increasingly became dependent on paid labor. They recruited workers abroad, primarily from India, China, and Sierra Leone. Many of the formerly enslaved people found new ways to make a living. They received little or no help from the Colonial Planter Society to build themselves as free people. Many of them became peasants. Those that could purchase land formed villages and communities of their own. And under harsh conditions, they began to grow their crops and sold them at the nearest markets. They grew ginger, sugarcane, bananas, and many other crops. The plantation owners despised the fact that villages were springing up. These new villages took away labor from them. The owners soon found ways to get heavy taxes placed on some of the most popular imported foods. This racist, oppressive, exploitative regime enacted brutal laws and levied high taxes on the black masses. It was this condition that inspired the 1865 uprising at Morant Bay. Paul Bogle called for unity of the black people because the planters and colonial elite intended to put blacks back into slavery. Paul Bogle's rebellion was crushed, and he was hanged on October 24, 1865, but his bold demonstration achieved its goals. It contributed to the establishment of fair practices in the legal system and led to a change in official attitude, enabling people to improve their lives socially and economically. In 1866, a new governor, John Peter Grant, was assigned to Jamaica to implement a series of reforms associated with the transition to a crown colony. Legislative Council and the Executive Privy Council were responsible for governing, but the colonial office exercised effective power through the presiding British governor. There were a few hand-picked Jamaicans included on the council strictly for the sake of appearances. Despite reform, abuse of the system continued. For example, forced labor and flogging were still prevalent in prisons. The state now conducted such punishments instead of slave owners. Crown colonial rule was modified towards the end of the 19th century. After 1884, representation and limited self-government were gradually reintroduced in Jamaica. The colony's legal system was reformed along the lines of English common law and county courts, and a constabulary force was established. Jamaica's upper class and British officials forged an unstated alliance based on their shared color, attitudes, and interests. This alliance was strengthened in London, where the West India Committee promoted Jamaican interests. The white or near-white aristocratic class continued to rule Jamaica in every respect. The vast majority of black people were poor and unable to exercise their rights. Babylon is the Rastafarian term referring to the white political power structure holding black people down for centuries through enslavement, poverty, and inequality. Against the backdrop of poverty and inequity, the roots of Rastafari grew. With such high unemployment across the island, migration to other countries became an obvious choice. Panama was a place where workers were needed. Ferdinand de Lesseps was organizing the construction of a new canal. The Jamaicans were not the only ones who went to Panama. The Chinese and Europeans also went. For many, the great job opportunity turned into a nightmare. Diseases such as malaria and yellow fever were rampant. The Jamaicans and the West Indians were tougher than their European counterparts, but thousands still died. Within nine years, after a shocking waste of life and money, the canal scheme collapsed. But many survivors stayed with the French and formed the first Caribbean community in Cologne. 
When the United States decided to build a canal in Panama in the early 20th century, many Jamaicans played a part in the canal's construction. Panama played an important role in developing the black consciousness. It provided a haven for exchanging information and ideas, and from there, people boarded steamers headed for exotic destinations. A few of the early Rastas visited Panama during this time, and so did Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey promoted black nationalism, black separatism, and pan-Africanism, the belief that all black people of the world should join in brotherhood and work to decolonize the continent of Africa, which was still controlled by the white colonialist powers back then. He wanted to create a black state in Africa and preached Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, one God, one aim, one destiny. Among his main objectives, just like the first Rastas, Marcus Garvey wanted to restore black people's dignity, which slavery and colonization had tried to degrade. Rastas see Marcus Garvey as a prophet, with his philosophy fundamentally shaping the movement. Many of the early Rastas had started as Garveyites. He is often seen as a second John the Baptist. However, Garvey may have inspired the Rastafari movement, but as a Roman Catholic, he didn't believe in it and thought of the Rastafari movement as a cult. Garvey was even critical of Haile Selassie for leaving Ethiopia at the time of the Italian fascist occupation. He said, Haile Selassie is the ruler of a country where black men are chained and flogged. He will go down in history as a great coward who ran away from his country. Despite all his uplifting teachings, Garvey failed to tackle the question of religion. In his endorsement of modern practical thinking, he neglected millions of followers' religious needs. In 1921, his Universal Negro Improvement Association created the African Orthodox Church. However, black people didn't want to worship a version of a messianic Christ who was tortured to death on a cross amongst thieves. For Garvey to succeed, blacks had to be able to identify with kings and princes. One of the most famous prophecies attributed to him involving the coronation of Haile Selassie was his 1927 pronouncement, Look to Africa, for there a black king shall be crowned. An associate of Garvey's, James Morris Webb, had made very similar public statements as early as 1921. So, if Marcus Garvey wasn't one of the first Rastas, who was? The making of the Rastafari movement can be seen in two parts, restoring the dignity of black people that slavery and colonization had stripped from them and setting them on a spiritual path that the white church did not dictate. What the Rasta foreigners had in common was the intention to uplift their followers. Those who came before offered an alternative to the Christianity that had been forced on them through slavery and colonization. As well as providing job opportunities, migration presented the potential for personal reinvention. Black West Indian migrants were able to reinvent their attachments to people and places due to their migration. From the 19th century, impostors, claiming to be Ethiopian royalty, appeared in the West Indies, the United States, Britain, and Ethiopia. In 1896, the Ethiopian nation experienced a watershed event when its emperor, Menelik, defeated Italian forces at the Battle of Adwa. This gave many black people a sense of pride and emboldened them to claim Ethiopia as their home. In his book Rastafari, Roots and Ideology, Barry Siobhan states that the way for Garvey was paved by the activities of several religious street preachers, two of whom, Isaac Uriah Brown and Prince Shrevington, laid claim to royal African lineage. Posing as royal Prince Thomas Isaac Makaruru of Ceylon, Isaac Uriah Brown asserted his family ties to Abyssinian royalty, sometimes as a brother or as a prince himself. While in Jamaica, the statements that he was reported to have made touched on several explosive issues. Jamaica's slave past, the oppressive social order, racism, the unequal tax system that disproportionately affected the peasants, the lack of workers' rights, low wages, and the inequitable legal system. By including the question of Africa in his critique, the prince added significant value to his commentary. He did not speak simply as a Jamaican, instead, he was speaking with the authority of Africa. In 1905, Brown was arrested and charged with sedition after encouraging a strike for higher wages and non-payment of taxes. 
He told his audiences that after emancipation, each enslaved person was meant to receive 16 acres of land in compensation, but that the whites took it, and he was going to land his troops to get it back. After serving his one-month sentence, Brown sailed to England, where he tried passing as Prince Thomas Makaruru, nephew and heir apparent of Menelik of Abyssinia. It was this authority of Africa that the prince maintained in his international travels and his varied personas. At the same time, his stories also reflected an astute grasp of the systemic inequalities in colonial Jamaica. Prince Shrevington Micheline also tried passing in Britain as the crown prince and grandson of Menelik II, but his adventures were not documented. In 1897, a preacher named Higgins returned from England, where he had joined the Ethiopianist movement. In Jamaica, he founded the revival group the Royal Millennium Baptist Missionary Society, commonly known as the Millennium Band, and aroused black consciousness with his frequent condemnation of the whites. He was referred to as Warrior Higgins, possibly because of his fiery preaching and scuffles with the police. Higgins went around announcing that the world would end at the turn of the millennium. He paraded through the streets with his Millennium Band. He claimed to have fought in Africa against the Boers. He made and sold herbal tonics to cure cramps, pains, rheumatism, nervousness, and loss of appetite, probably using ganga. He announced that he intended to marry a white woman to spite the white folks. He said they would all want to cut their throats because seeing a black man like me with a white wife would be such a shock. Higgins denounced all clergy and judges as corrupt. He was reportedly seen one night riding on horseback with a hundred of his followers armed with sticks. In 1902, Higgins was severely beaten by baton-wielding men later described as vigilantes. He died shortly after. Who these vigilantes were remained a mystery. Is it possible that Higgins' preaching struck a nerve within the establishment? As a result of Brown, Shrevington, and Higgins' efforts, awareness about Africa was kept alive among the cities and rural poor in the early 20th century, providing the impetus for Robert Athley I. Rogers to create the Afro-Athlican Constructive Church in the 1920s. Robert Athley Rogers migrated from Anguilla to the U.S. at an early age. He lived in Newark, New Jersey for a time, before touring South America and the West Indies. Rogers founded an Afrocentric religion in his 20s, the afro african Constructive Church. The church preached self-reliance and self-determination for Africans. During his travels, Rogers attended a Universal Negro Improvement Association meeting in Newark and was very impressed with Marcus Garvey's discourse. He felt he and Garvey had a shared vision. He wrote the Holy Piety, also known as the Blackman's Bible, between 1913 and 1917. It was eventually published in 1924. The Holy Piety includes rules of conduct, religious doctrines, references to Ethiopia and Egypt, as well as to apostles, saints, and God. All are depicted as being black. Rogers regarded Garvey so highly that he dedicated the seventh chapter of the Holy Piety to him and proclaimed him an apostle of God. This book was banned in Jamaica and other Caribbean islands in the middle of the late 20s. Today it is recognized by many Rastafarians as a primary source for study. With the Piety, Rogers had provided the spiritual connections lacking in Garvey's teachings. Alexander Bedward, a great healer with followers all over Jamaica, Cuba, and Panama, was undoubtedly the most famous preacher of the time, thanks to the prophecies of a hermit. Bedwardism sprang up in Spanish town at the end of the 19th century with a very old, barefoot prophet called Shakespeare. Harrison E. Shakespeare Woods, more commonly known as Shakespeare, came from America and lived in Spanish town. He was a hermit prophet who lived in a cave in the wilderness. Shakespeare regularly left his cave on missions of love, preaching the word of God and prophesying. In 1876, he left his cave and moved to August Town, a village along the Hope River bordering eastern Kingston. There he founded the Jamaica Native Baptist Free Church. In 1891, he announced his retirement as bishop of the church and informed his congregation that Alexander Bedward would succeed him. 
he prophesied that Bedward, whom Shakespeare had previously inducted as an elder of the church in 1889, would be the leader of a great religious movement centered in August Town and that fruits would so abound in August Town that from various parts of the world people will come to gather them. Bedward, born sometime between 1840 and 1846, had lived an excessive life in his youth on the Mona estate before migrating to Panama. Whilst there, he claimed he had had two visions and was tormented and commanded to go to August Town. When Shakespeare died in 1901, Bedward replaced him at the head of the congregation, which was to become the powerful Jamaica Native Baptist Free Church. Bedward became a household name in Jamaica two years after being consecrated as a bishop. He healed the sick in the waters of the Hope River, where he claimed that God had led him. Defections from the traditional European churches, primarily Anglicans and Methodists, to the native church, which began with Shakespeare Wood's warnings of disaster if the people did not repent, increased when foreign papers and magazines reported on Bedward's healing powers. Thousands of visitors from overseas came to August Town to be touched by the healer. Bedward appears to have been an intelligent and kind leader. Thousands of poor and illiterate people came to him to be washed from degradation and servitude. His famous healings in Mona River appeared to be psychological, but to the sufferers, they were real. Those he healed suffered from depression, and Bedward restored their sense of dignity. Bedward fervently denounced the oppression of blacks in Western societies and taught his people the Black Revolution. Among other things, he explained to his followers how, in the 19th century, Sam Sharp and Paul Bogle rebelled against the white establishment, standing up for their rights at the risk of their life. Bedward was arrested many times for his subversive activities. Jamaica's privileged class feared Bedward's fiery sermons, and in 1895 the press and police falsely accused him of advocating insurrection. Philip Stern, a white lawyer, defended Bedward. Bedward was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to an asylum. After being released on a technicality, he continued his ministry. Hostilities began shortly after when the anti-Bedward establishment mobilized its opposition. Churches that lost members to the Jamaica Native Baptist Free Church and doctors whose medicines didn't have the same instant and magical effect as Bedward's healing were at the forefront of the movement. A proclamation was issued by Roman Catholic Bishop Charles Gordon forbidding all Roman Catholics from going to Bedward's stream or encouraging other Roman Catholics to go there. This proclamation was read in all Catholic churches and schools in Jamaica. Anglican Bishop Enos Nuttall led a march to protest Bedwardism in Kingston. Bedward was accused of incitement and sedition several times, but his highly skilled lawyer, Philip Stern QC, kept him out of prison most of the time. To give his followers hope, he often quoted Joel 2 verse 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Psalm 68 verse 31 was another of his favorite verses, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. By 1920, Bedward decided that his powers had failed. Another Jamaican, Marcus Garvey, had become prominent, and Bedward identified Garvey as Moses and himself merely as Moses' spokesman, Aaron. This declaration helped to lead his followers into Garveyism. In April 1921, Bedward rebuffed armed police attempts to evict him from his home, flouted a ban on marching, and led a procession of 800 followers to the city to show the people of Kingston how strong he was. An armed force surrounded the procession and arrested Bedward and several hundred supporters. After being released by the judge, Bedward was rearrested, declared insane, and again committed to Bellevue Mental Hospital, where he died in 1930. Under the leadership of Bedward's son-in-law, George Burke, the church failed. Rastafari owes a lot to Bedward, whose speeches sought to empower black people. In 1932, one of his disciples named Hines found a new leader in Leonard Percival Howell. To recap. You have heard that Isaac Uriah Brown, Prince Shrevington, and Marcus Garvey promoted the dignity of the black man. Then we had Rasta Forerunners, Warrior Higgins, Robert Athley I. Rogers, Harrison E. Shakespeare Woods, and Alexander Bedward, who catered to the spiritual needs of the black man. Next, we will examine those proto-Rastas who proclaimed Haile Selassie as a living god. <laughs>